Well, good morning. This is the Lou Rockwell Show, and what a treat it is to have as our guest this morning, Mr. Eric Margulies. Murray Rothbard always used to complain that all the terrorism experts on television uh, and newspapers all were just spouting the regime's line. They were not actually experts at all. It seems to me it's exactly the same thing with foreign policy experts. They all are, you know, quote unquote experts rather than actual experts, and they are all spouting the regime line. And it's so, uh, so great that LRC, this show, and also our daily articles uh, once a week have a wonderful article from Eric Margulies, who's an actual foreign policy expert. I mean, he's somebody who's traveled so extensively, speaks a number of foreign languages, has studied deeply the peoples and countries, economics and culture and of all the trouble spots in the world, especially in the Middle East and uh, close by areas. And Eric, there are some people who think that Hamas was created in part by foreign intelligence services to compete with the secular uh, Palestinian Lib Liberation Organization. And uh, certainly it's, it's been very convenient for some people. Is the same true of ISIS? I mean, ISIS certainly seems to have uh, revivified Americans' interest in going to war. Uh, they're afraid that ISIS is about to take Cleveland. It seems like a brilliant creation of somebody, not to say that these people aren't for real in many senses, but tell me, is that, is that wrong? What, uh, what are your thoughts about ISIS and what's happening in Iraq right now? I was there when Hamas began. Its growth was assisted by the Israeli government, by Israel's Mossad, as a way of splitting the Palestinian movement. Uh, in fact, it backfired on them very badly. Uh, Hezbollah, same thing in Lebanon. Uh, was Its growth was assisted by the Israeli government until there was, they had a falling out. There's something very weird and strange and not right about ISIS. I watch the events unfold, for example, like the battle that's going on currently for the by nothing town of Ramadi, and uh, nothing looks right, uh, uh, nothing rings right. Uh, I've covered 14 wars in my time as a war correspondent. I've never seen anything like this. It looks more like theater than actual fighting. And I've, I have very strong suspicion without the proof that uh, ISIS indeed has is a creation of the Western powers because it's so very useful in keeping the U.S. in war and uh, keeping U.S. forces active in the Middle East. No, it's it's true. And it, uh, I noticed that the Saudi Arabians, I saw reference to an ad they uh, were running yesterday looking for a bunch of more um, beheaders because they're executing so many people and they wanted a uh, swordsman capable of cutting people's heads off. No American seems to care about that. But when people's heads are cut off, and of course, it's obviously uh, monstrous and evil to murder people, however you do it. What I think of as a PR gimmick of, uh, of ISIS has riveted people, not only in the United States, but uh, all over the West. It's been a, uh, I'm afraid, a brilliant success. In fact, I can remember when at one point an Israeli official was asked, who would you rather see out of existence, Assad, strong men of Syria, or ISIS? And he said, uh, we'd much prefer to deal with ISIS. Doesn't it seem that a lot of American arms seem to end up with ISIS? No matter what the, what, what the U.S. claims it, it's doing, it's, uh, in fact, arming ISIS massively. Well, ISIS has grabbed a lot of arms from uh, Iraqi government, uh, useless troops. But it's true. Arms are finding a way to ISIS. I, it's part of the civil war that we created uh, in Syria. Uh, and uh, there's been a steady flow of arms from the the Arab Gulf states like Qatar and uh, the UAE uh, and aided by Turkey, which has its own murky role in this, to arm ISIS and other extremist groups like the Nusra Front and other crazies running around in Syria. So they're getting arms, they're getting money. And, uh, you know, if we had wanted to wipe out ISIS, uh, we could have. But instead, what we're doing is doing this light bombing and formed another of our famous coalitions. And uh, <laughs> lots of other countries comply at war, like Canada, for example, uh, that claims it's fighting terrorism globally. Uh, and it's a cheap, low cost war, uh, but it gets wins votes at home by people who are, as you said, frightened. Well, I find it astounding. I mean, the. Uh... How shall, I, how shall I put this? ISIS doesn't have an air force, doesn't have any ships. 
I mean, they would have actually no way of getting to the United States, even if they had vast uh, numbers. That's quite right. But, you know, uh, one of the reasons was some poll studies that were done after President Bush's second term election was that one of the strongest support was in exurbia, uh, you know, right out in the Bible Belt areas and uh, far from the cities where housewives felt that Osama bin Laden was going to come and get their little Johnnies on the way to soccer practice if we don't keep, you know, that ex unless we elected President Bush to wage uh, crusades abroad. I mean, that's how uninformed people are. To fight them over there so we wouldn't have to fight them over here. That's exactly right. ISIS, by the way, appears to have one tank. They keep showing it <laughs> over and over again. They have one T-55 <laughs> tank that they captured. And, uh, you know, what's funny is that the Iraqi army, which has been trained at vertiginous expense by the U.S., and armed by the U.S. to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars, while our trains are breaking down, we have money to give to Iraq. Um, they, uh, these are trained soldiers. ISIS people are not trained soldiers. They're scruffy teenagers who have gone off on some kind of modern version of children's crusade. And the only trained fighters in the ISIS camp are, are veterans of Saddam Hussein's army. The rest of them are just young, young punks running around with burp guns. Well, when I think of the Iraqi army, of course, the U.S. destroyed the Iraqi economy as well as uh, Iraqi society with the invasion and, and occupation. These guys don't have much much of an economic opportunity. seems to me that's why many of them join the army, just to get the salary. But on the other hand, why should they die for uh, for Baghdad? I mean, why, why if it's really a fight, why shouldn't they uh, head out of town? You're, you're quite right. The, the current Iraqi government is regarded as a, a sock puppet of the Western powers. Uh, it commands no loyalty in Iraq. And as you say, they're, they're there because they're being paid. Uh, one could also say that about the U.S. Army, too, to an extent. We see over and over again, we see the same problem in Afghanistan. The government commands no loyal, it has no respect, and it's regarded as an agent of the foreigners. So uh, you're right, well, who can expect them to fight? You know, thinking of the U.S. Army on a slightly different topic, it's been a very long time since it actually faced significant troops, poor people with ancient rifles in the, in the mountains of Afghanistan. But I sometimes wonder what actually would happen to the present group of American soldiers if they actually would have faced real opposition. Let's say the Russians. Seems like the U.S. is just right on the edge of wanting a war with Russia. Well, yes, you're quite right. And, you know, I've often remarked on this that uh, the, uh, the American army, and I speak as an, an army veteran, American army uh, has been trained and configured to fight colonial wars. It's an imperial army, and it's become like the British army was in the 1880s and 1890s, used to fight tribesmen on the northwest frontier. When the British army met the German regulars on the western front, uh, they were very, very disconcerted. They, they were really badly beaten initially. The, uh, the American army has to go through the same process. It's still configured to fight imperial wars, but uh, there's a consensus in the Pentagon, at least, that the real fight is going to be with China. The U.S. Air Force is, is configuring itself to fight an air war in the Pacific off the coast of China. It's developing interesting new strategies. But uh, the army... Uh, certainly is not. And uh, the army is still back in the, you know, General Kitchener days. Uh, and it uh, has not, it has lost its its sharp edge in fighting a modern war. As you say, we almost went to war with Russia over Ukraine. It may still happen. Very interesting what you say of them wanting to target China. Certainly that's the, the pivot to Asia and, and a lot of the trade, the TPP trade treaty uh, has to do with fighting China. Even I noticed Obama the other day saying the U.S. has to write the rules for trade in, in that part of the world. Otherwise, the Chinese might write them. Well, so well the China, just... China's an important power. Why shouldn't they have something to say? I remember once hearing Bill Kristol uh, denouncing the Chinese. This is some years ago, a premature Sinophobe, saying that uh, there was a real threat that China sought to be the dominant power in the South China Sea. 
I mean, it seems to me like they're saying, watch out, the U.S. seeks to be the dominant power in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, I'm just reading a book by uh, uh, a Chinese strategist named Ming Fen, who uh, called China Dream, and it's about how China is is going to become the world's greatest power. It's on the way. The and the U.S. has to step back in the theory. Of the, this is the author speaking. The U.S. has to step back and accept that China is the big boy in the region, even though China has no desire to conquer or rule other nations. Uh, and he said it never has. So uh, that's an interesting thought. I, I've, I've often written that this is going to be the dominant theme of, the, of this century, is if and how the U.S. can accommodate the growth of Chinese power and Indian power without getting into a war. Jim Rogers uh, points out that many peoples have been great once, whether it's the Romans or the... Uh the Greeks or the French or whatever, but the, the Chinese have been great twice. And he thought that in some sense, this is going to be not in a military sense, but this was culturally and economically going to be, the future was going to be in China. It's why he moved to Singapore to teach his children. So his children would uh, grow up learning how to speak Mandarin, because he thought this was indeed the future from an economic and a cultural standpoint, not from a military standpoint. Well, I think so. The Chinese make much of their cultural superiority. I mean, in this book that I just mentioned, the, the author keeps saying how Chinese are the most intelligent people on, in the world. He said, just look at school test results. And one, well, it's true, of one, course. Can, <laughs> one has to say, yes. And, and the Chinese have a 5,000 year old culture, which uh, gives them great moral and intellectual strength. So China looks like it has everything going for it, and this will be the China century rather than America's century. America has wasted its all of its brain power and money on these foolish colonial wars in the Middle East and in Afghanistan, whereas China has been cashing in, getting all the money and buying up resources and influence in countries around the world. So it seems very clear, but uh, there's always a, one problem lurking in Chinese history, and that is uh, centrifugal forces, as the geopoliticians used to say. And that is that China uh, is so big and, and so complex that it also always runs the risk of, uh, of starting to fall apart and weaken and getting in regionalism, uh, local wars and things. Uh, so this started to happen during the Cultural Revolution of the 1970s. So uh, everything looked great for China, but you can never be sure. I have a friend who visited China uh, shortly after Mao's death when, uh, for example, Confucianism uh, had been uh, outlawed and, and we thought wiped out in some sense uh, during, the, during Mao's reign. And my friend said all over Ch China, and he traveled extensively, uh, there were very well-kept uh, Confucian cemeteries, Confucian temples. And he said he thought that, uh, as also has been sometimes true in Chinese history, the emperor didn't, his writ didn't necessarily run everywhere and on everything. The mountains are high and the imperial palace is far away, as the old <laughs> Chinese saying goes. And it's true. Uh, I mean, one could spend your life in China and India as well, trying to figure out the country. It's so complicated. God help us uh, trying to do it. We, we're we still trying to find out what happened to Herzegovina from Bosnia, Herzegovina. We have a, a a brain gap in foreign affairs in Washington and across the United States, so we're going to have a lot of trouble wrestling with this problem. You mentioned India, and the U.S., of course, is uh, uh, doing a lot to try to uh, entice India into a, a, a strong alliance with the U.S., but also is afraid of India, afraid of a possible Chinese-Indian uh, alliance in the same sense as a Russian-Chinese alliance. Tell me what uh, what you think is happening as far as India and its military power and economic power. Well, India's power is growing, uh, but uh, and it's it's turning in, into an important military power. You know, when he hears all this, uh, these these hysterical uh, warnings about Iran's nuclear powers. I, India has up to 80 nuclear weapons, and India is just uh, deploying now submarines that can fire nuclear-tipped sea-launched missiles, which could stand off uh, Washington and fire them, or India is developing a whole range of intercontinental ballistic missiles, 
with nuclear weapons. Why? Why? Why does India need a, uh, a three, four thousand mile range missile, five thousand mile range? On uh, we're not quite quite clear. But but India is has made very clear since I follow Indian military affairs that the uh, Indian Ocean belongs to it. And uh, outsiders stay away from our Mare Nostrum. Uh, this is interesting because at some point India could come into conflict with the United States. But right now I see no possibility of an Indian-Chinese alliance. In fact, my first book, War at the Top of the World, uh, I postulated that uh, China and India would go to war in the 21st century, and they'd fight over... And they did have a war in the 20th century, didn't they? That's right. A brief of border, I think it was 1963, on the eastern end of the what was then uh, North East Frontier Agency. Um, and uh, But today they have a 2,500-mile border, which thanks to the British is very poorly demarcated. The British, who, who drew the lines, uh, used thick nib pens, I mean, silly as this sounds, uh, and this left a border with the questionable areas all along the eastern border, Aruna, Aruna Chal Pradesh, as it's called today, uh, or the Chinese call it South Tibet. And then there's another chunk of land in the west called uh, Aksai Chin, which uh, the uh, Indians claim is part of Kashmir. That's another whole dispute. Uh, so it's uh, it's very complicated. I see lots of um, tensions between the two. And each one, of course, wants to be the big boy in, in Asia. And uh, there's no love lost between the Chinese and the Indians. Eric, you've pointed out in the past the uh, sometimes extreme danger of an atomic war between Pakistan and India, that nobody seems to pay any attention to what that would actually mean for those poor people as well as the world. That's quite right. I think it's one of the, the probably the primary danger we're facing, though uh, the current uh, White House and Congress are doing their best to push us into another near-death experience in Ukraine. But India and Pakistan are at, at scimitars drawn. They have a million men deployed facing each other on the border of Kashmir. Uh, they've been arguing about this piece of land since 1947. It's the world's oldest major border dispute. And it's very dangerous because India has developed its conventional forces so highly that they can now overrun Pakistan, even though Pakistan has a big and very capable army of around 400,000 men. Do you, think that's, do you think that's a danger, I mean, of them actually invading Pakistan? And I do. They threaten to do it many times. The Indian military is chomping at the bit. It takes about two days by tank to cut uh, Pakistan in half, and it's it's narrow waste waste portion. So the problem is that India is fighting in Kashmir. The Indian army wants to go and teach the Pak's a lesson, as they say. Uh, Pakistan knows it can't withstand a, a full scale Indian conventional attack. So it's developed a range of tactical nuclear weapons that uh, are designed to hold off the Indians. And that has been an effect policy. But the trouble is they're on a three minute early warning alert. And uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's terrifying. And the radar system gets a three minute alert. This is in countries where the telephones don't work. And they have to call and find somebody. And what do we do? Uh, meanwhile, they, it looks like enemy missiles are on the way. Well, uh, a major nuclear exchange, uh, you know, could kill probably a Rand Corporation estimated about uh, two million people initially, but uh, uh, or a hundred million people eventually due to illness or radiation poisoning. And just as bad, it could release clouds of radioactive dust that would circle the earth and fall on our heads. And also, of course, the radioactive dust in the atmosphere, uh, keeping the sun from shining on us and bringing on a on a uh, very, very cold temperature is bad for agriculture and human life in general. And meanwhile, they're worried about Crimea. Oh, which should be no worry to anyone. I know. Uh, we, they pay attention to small issues. 
uh, he was not, had no interest in Crimea, uh, had no interest in that part of the world. But uh, the minute the Russians moved in, all of a sudden it became a, a major event. Even the Crimea was predominantly Russian, even when it was ruled by Ukraine, which got Crimea in, in uh, 1954. Nikita Khrushchev, who was Ukrainian, uh, at a uh, special event dinner, uh, got drunk as usual and uh, gave Crimea to the Ukraine Socialist Republic. In those days, it meant nothing but uh, under the Soviet Union, but now it, it means a great deal. But uh, anybody who knows that part of the world would know that there was no way that the Russians were going to let the, the hero city of Sevastopol, of its great port, uh, fall into hands of NATO or the Ukrainians or anybody else. It's like us giving up Houston. So here we have all these problems. But let's uh, go back just as we finish up, Eric. What's happening with the Palestinians? I guess everybody's forgotten them. Uh, they're not really an issue anymore, are they? I mean, uh, or are they an issue? They're certainly not an issue in America, except as uh, hate objects. Uh, what about in the Arab world? What about in the broader Muslim world? Or has Bibi Netanyahu settled that problem to his satisfaction. I'm sorry to say, I think he has. The Palestinians have been totally marginalized, delegitimized, and forgotten. And not only in the West, where they're, as you write, they're held as a hate figure by the uh, pro Netanyahu media, but they're uh, they're scorned and ignored by their Arab brothers. Just as much, you know, the the the, the biggest uh, expulsion of Palestinians was done by the Israelis in 1948. The second biggest was done by Kuwait when Arafat came out and the backing Saddam Hussein in his dispute with uh, Kuwait. So uh, hundreds of thousands were kicked out of Kuwait. So no, it's hopeless, and uh, the and the only significant Arab power that's left Egypt is now completely in cahoots with Israel and is violently anti-Palestinian. So the only recourse left to the Palestinians are, are, is violence to keep their, their name and their cause in front of the world. Because we know the Israelis hold all the cards. Netanyahu actually defeated President Obama in, in trying to promote uh, Palestinian settlement. There never will be a Palestinian state unless it's in the desert somewhere. And uh, the Palestinians, in my view, have absolutely no hope. And of course, doesn't the, the Likud uh, party platform say there will never be a, a Palestinian state? That's quite right. Even and, though we're supposed to hate the Hamas for saying they don't want a Jewish state. And even, uh, you know, it's not just the United States, which uh, is, is totally dominated by pro-Israel sentiment, but Canada... Uh, has become even more militant than the Likud party. It's become uh, an extension of Israel's far right. And France has moved very much in that direction too, not to mention Australia. Uh, so the, uh, the Palestinians have no allies. The Russians even have sort of given them short shrift. Uh, the only states that supported them was Syria. That's why there's so much pressure to overthrow President Assad in Syria, because not only will it take away the strongest supporter of the Palestinians, but it also cement Israel's control of the Golan Heights, with the Syrian Golan Heights, which it has quietly annexed. Well, Eric, thank you for uh, telling us the truth. Thank you for uh, all the work you do. And uh, it's so wonderful, to, it's such an honor to have your column at uh, LRC. And we'll, of course, with this podcast, link to your archive, link to your Facebook page, a YouTube channel, and to your, to your two books. Are you working on a new book, by the way? I am fitfully, Lou. It's called uh, Camping with Gaddafi and Other Adventures in the Third World. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Well, sounds wonderful. I, I'm working on it when I get a chance. Eric, I look forward to it. And thanks so much for coming on. Thanks again for your wonderful perspective. It's great to hear about all these issues from somebody who actually understands and uh, has the experience necessary to evaluate what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Bye-bye, sir. Bye. Well, thanks so much for listening to The Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the LRC front page. Thank you.